Well, hello, it's Sunday, and we're excited to be able to join you like this. We miss you, we wish we could be together, but I'm thankful for technology, which allows us to connect like this. Now, something very special is happening today. As you see, we are in our Bible Zone location. So this should really be exciting for all of our Bible Zone students. And you know what? We have prepared a special video just for you. And the link to that video is below. So we're really excited to be able to join you like this. Pastor Eversley has prepared a great message. But before we jump into that, let's worship together by watching this music video.
Well, good morning, Cornerstone. It's Sunday, March 29th, and we have another opportunity to gather in this very different and unique way that God has given us to get together so we can worship God together, but also so that we can hear God. Today, we're going to look at a topic that I'm very familiar with, and it's do you suffer from spiritual nearsightedness? Now, first of all, I need to give you my credentials with regard to this whole topic of nearsightedness. So from the age of seven, I became very, very nearsighted. Like most people who are nearsighted say they have a prescription of minus five or minus six. Well, my good eye is minus 13. So I'm really qualified to talk about this whole topic of nearsightedness. I experienced things like in, in primary school where guys would take my glasses and one guy looked up in the sky and he said, I'm watching a football game in Australia and everybody laughed. And then another guy, he took my glasses and he looked at my stomach and he said, I can see you had chicken for lunch. And they all laughed at me. So this, I've experienced 50 years of severe nearsightedness, so I know what I'm talking about. So because I was nearsighted and severely nearsighted, here's what would happen. Oftentimes, when I didn't have my glasses on, I couldn't walk confidently because I couldn't see what others would see. And so I would make decisions based on misinformation because what I was looking at wasn't what was really going on. I would look and I couldn't see. In order for me to see the TV, I had to be inches away from it in order for me to see it clearly. So spiritual, uh, physical nearsightedness is you can't see what others can see and therefore you can't walk confidently and therefore you make decisions based on misinformation, right? Because of your lack of vision. Well. Spiritual nearsightedness is kind of different. And throughout this message, we're going to be going from the physical to the spiritual. Spiritual nearsightedness, think about this now, is when a believer can only see what somebody in the world sees. I want you to think about this. So here is a believer filled with the Spirit of God. They have the Word of God. They have the availability of the wisdom of God. But they look at a situation, and the only thing that they can see is the same thing as what somebody in the world sees. Somebody who doesn't have the Spirit of God, who doesn't read the Word of God, who is not aligned with the wisdom of God. And so if a believer can only see what the world sees, that means that we can only make decisions similar to them. Spiritual 2020 is when we look at a situation and we see it for what it is in the physical, but we also see God and who he is, and then we interpret the situation through a different lens, and that's through the lens of faith. This thing called faith is the critical ingredient in having spiritual 2020 vision. All right? We're going to look in the Word of God, and we're going to start in the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 5. The Bible says, Paul writes this. He says, Therefore, we are always confident and know that as long as we are at home in the body... We are away from the Lord. So the first thing he does is he makes this uh, distinction between the physical and the spiritual. And he says, as long as we are on this earth, we are away from God. Now we know that doesn't mean spiritual and relationally because Jesus Christ has brought us near to God if we are children of God. But what he is talking about is in the physical, as long as we are on this earth, we are away from God. The Bible describes a time when we are going to see Jesus face to face. And that's completely different as to how we are living now. And so what Paul is saying is, right now, we are physically separated from God. Not spiritually, not relationally, because Jesus Christ has brought us close to God. But right now, physically, we are separated from God. And then, as a result of that, he says, for we live by faith, not by sight. So here's what he says. As long as we are physically separated from God, the key ingredient to how we live is this thing called faith because we haven't seen Jesus face to face. And so the ingredient that we need to have, the ingredient that we need to develop, the ingredient that we need to build in order for us to interpret what we see while we are on this earth is this thing called faith. It's the key to spiritual 2020. Then he writes this. I say and would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So he says, I would much prefer to leave here and be with God face to face. But he says, so we make it our goal to please him, whether we are at home in the body or away from it. So then he says, whether we're here or whether we're with God, there's no difference. The thing that we need to do is to please God. And the way that we do it while we are here is to develop our faith. So here's what we're going to do. 
we're going to go through a very familiar story. It's the story of David and Goliath. And we're going to look at some people who looked at the very same thing in the physical, but because they had different visions spiritually, they made different decisions, they said different things, and they had different actions. Now, remember, they looked at the very same thing in the spiritual. And they were all part of Israel. They were all part of God's people. But because of their spiritual sight, some of them were spiritual nearsighted, and so they made, difference, they made their choices based on that. David, on the other hand, had spiritual 20-20, and therefore he made his decisions differently than they did. So we're going to go to 1 Samuel chapter 17, and we're going to skip through this story. We're not going to read the whole thing. We're going to read parts, make some comments, and then pick it up later on in the chapter. So 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 4. A champion named Goliath, who was from Gath, came out of the Philistine camp. His height was about six cubits and a span. He's about nine feet tall. He had a bronze helmet on his head and wore a coat of scale armor of bronze weighing 5,000 shekels. On his legs, he wore bronze greaves and a bronze javelin was slung on his back. His spear shaft was like a reaver's rod and its iron point weighed 600 shekels. His shield bearer went ahead of him. Now, there are a lot of measurements in there that we're not familiar with, but suffice it to say that this was an awesome sight. You have a nine-foot man with a bunch of gear, a shield bearer in front of him. The gear is substantial. It weighs a whole lot. And so Israel is looking at this man, a man probably which they had never seen the size of him, probably, and, and definitely there's no one the size of him in Israel's army. So they are seeing this man coming out and are awed by what they see. Remember that word, awed, because we're going we're gonna to revisit that. But they're awed by what they see. They see Goliath, and they're like, man, can, can you believe how big he is? Then it says this, Goliath stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, why do you come out and line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine? And are you not the servants of Saul? He calls them the servants of Saul, not of God. Choose a man and have him come down to me. If he is able to fight and kill me, we will become your subjects. But if I overcome him and kill him, you will become our subjects and serve us. Then the Philistine said, This day I defy the armies of Israel. Give me a man and let us fight each other. So Goliath comes out and he sets the stakes. The stakes are high. Think about this. This is not where one man fights the other, and then one of them just gains what the other man has. But basically what Goliath is saying, here's what the stakes are. The stakes are, every one of you, your lives depend on the result of the fight between me and one man from your side. So a whole nation's um, survival, a whole nation's lifestyle is dependent on this, this uh, fight between Goliath and whoever decides to fight him. It says, on hearing this, on hearing the Philistines' words, Saul, the leader of the army, and all the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. It says, on hearing what Goliath had to say, they were terrified. Now, I want to speak to you for a minute about how important what you hear is. Okay? They hear, heard from Goliath. Goliath put his proposal on the table, and they heard from Goliath. Now, with regard to spiritual vision, what you hear is critically important. And what I think is happening in this time that we're in now, there is a lot of you who are hearing what's going on. And you need to hear what's going on. You need to be able to sift through everything that you hear on TV and get the facts of what's going on. You absolutely need that. But what happened is, we are having a, a lot of us are having this huge diet of what's going on in the world, and no diet of God. We're not hearing from God. And so there's no balance. All we hear is what the world is telling us about what's going on. And again, we need to hear it. We need the facts. But because we're not hearing from God, we can only interpret what we hear based on what the world is telling us. Romans chapter 10 gives us a very, very important lesson in this. It says, but not all the Israelites accepted the good news. This is Romans chapter 10, verse 16. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our message? Consequently, faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word about Christ. So here's what the Bible says. It says faith rises based on what we hear. 
in this time, when we are dealing with everything that this world is dealing with, ensure that you are hearing from God. Take some time, spend some time in the Word of God to make sure that you're hearing from God so that your faith can rise and so that you can interpret everything you see with spiritual vision rather than spiritual nearsightedness. You see, if you don't take time to hear from God, then what happens is everything that, everything that you hear apart from God becomes your reality. What has to happen is we need the facts, but we also need to know what God is saying in order for faith to rise. Because if faith does not rise, then we become spiritually nearsighted. And the only vision we have is the same vision that the world has. We have the wisdom of God. We have the word of God. We have um, God saying that he will give to us what we need in order to get through this time. But we have to spend time where we have made a decision to hear from God. Here's the problem. The world is always in your face. You are always going to hear the news. It's going to tell you what's going on. You can't avoid it. But we have to make a decision to hear from God. Because if we don't make a decision, then we're not going to hear what we need from God to get us through this time with faith being the thing that drives us through. And this is what God wants us to do. He wants us to see what's going on, to know what's going on, not to be uninformed about what's going on, but also we need to be informed about what God says about this whole thing. So spend time ensuring you hear from God because like we just read in Romans, faith comes through hearing. Faith comes through hearing. So if you fail to hear, your faith will not rise. Please make sure during this time that you are spending time hearing from God. Now let's pick up our story in verse 23. It says, As he, David, was talking to them, Goliath, the Philistine champion from Gath, stepped out from his lines and shouted his usual defiance. So he came out and he said what we heard before. And David heard him. Whenever the Israelites saw, first they heard, now it says, whenever the Israelites saw the man, they all fled from him in great fear. So it says, when they saw him, they fled from him with great fear. Why did they flee from him? Because all they saw was a physical man. They could not see anything in the spiritual. They were spiritually nearsighted, and David wasn't. So if, you are, if you're not balanced in what you hear and what you see, you can only respond based on the physical. You can't interject the spiritual. And so here's what they concluded. They concluded it was Israel against, Philist against the Philistines. It was whoever fought Goliath against Goliath. But here's what God wants us to see. It is not me against my situation. It is not me against another person. It is me and God against my situation. It is me and God. Oh, I didn't even want to, say, I'll reverse that. It is God first and me versus my situation. And that's how they should have seen it. It is God and Israel versus Goliath. But they were spiritually nearsighted. They couldn't see that. And so they ran in fear. Same thing will happen from us. If we're spiritually nearsighted, we'll see all of this. It'll overwhelm us and we will cower in fear. And God tells us that we've not been given a spirit of fear. So I need you to understand something. Your spiritual diet will determine how you react in this time. Now, we all know about a physical diet, right? We all know if you, your physical diet is ice cream and donuts, your body's going to react. We also know if you eat a healthy diet, your, 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 di your body reacts positively. Your spiritual diet in this time is so important if you neglect your spiritual body, you will become spiritually flabby and out of shape and therefore spiritually nearsighted. But what God wants for you during this time and every single period in our lives is for us to be spiritually fit. He wants us to be spiritual, spiritual bodybuilders. Now, not taking steroids or anything like that, but eating healthily and doing what we need to do to remain spiritual, spiritually fit. All right? Now, let's pick up our story. Pick up our story in verse 25, and it says this. Now the Israelites had been saying, do you see how this man keeps coming out? He comes out to defy Israel. The king will give great wealth to the man who kills him. He will also give him his daughter in marriage and will exempt his family 
from taxes in Israel. Wow, what a gift. So Saul says, anybody who goes out and fights Goliath and defeats him, I'm going to make this guy wealthy. And here's something you need to understand, something about spiritual nearsightedness. If you are, spiritual near, if you are spiritually nearsighted, you need something other than the will of God and the glory of God to motivate you. Israel should have been motivated by the will of God and the glory of God. But Saul knew that these guys weren't motivated by that because they were spiritually nearsighted. And so what he had to do was to put something else out there to try to get them to do what they were supposed to do. And he does it by exempting them from taxes, by giving them great wealth, and by giving them his daughter. So if you are spiritually nearsighted, you won't be motivated by the will of God or the glory of God. Spiritual 2020, you are motivated primarily and only by God's will and God's glory. And when you see those things, you act. Spiritual nearsightedness, you won't act when you see those things because you need something else to motivate you other than the will and the glory of God. Okay, let's pick up our story again and we're almost done. David said to Saul, now listen to David's, what he says and how it differs from what everyone else has said so far. David said to Saul, let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant will go and fight him. Saul replied, you are not able to go out against this Philistine and fight him. You are only a young man, and he has been a warrior from his youth. So David interjects with spiritual 2020. Saul beats the spiritual 2020 down and interjects with spiritual nearsightedness and says, basically, what you're suggesting is not possible. And realize this, oftentimes when you have spiritual 2020 and God is moving and he wants you to do something for his glory, it may be even people of God who look at you because they're spiritually nearsighted and they try and knock you down. I want to encourage you, hear from God, be motivated by his will and his glory, and get counsel, yeah, that's always important. Um, but if, if you know God is instructing you to move, like David did, then act. It says then, the Lord, and, and David says to him, the Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hand of this Philistine. So here's what David says. David says, here's how I interpret my life, here's how I interpret what I see, here's how I interpret every situation. I see how awesome the situation is, but I also see how much more awesome my God is. If you're spiritually nearsighted, all you can see is how awesome your situation is. And we are in an awesome situation right now. But if you have spiritual 2020, you look at God first and you say, God is awesome. We're in a, what looks like it's an impossible situation, but because of who God is, I know that he can bring us through this, Okay. And David makes a decision with every single fact that every other, every other member of the Israelite army had, but with facts that they discounted. And that's who God is, what he is capable of, and what he wants to do in and through us. So spiritual 2020 assesses all situations after considering God first. So here's what nearsightedness does. Spiritual nearsightedness does. It looks at what you can do right now. There's some things that we can't do. We can't meet together in our location like we normally do. We can't um, worship God with our band, with our, with, our, with our worship team, with all of the things that we are accustomed to. Spiritual nearsightedness causes you to look at what you can't do. Spiritual vision causes you to see what you can do. You can spend time with God. You probably have more of an opportunity than you've ever had before during these weeks to spend time with God. If every one of us take the opportunity during this time to spend time with God, guess what? When we get together again, individually we'll be spiritually more fit, and guess what? The church will be stronger. The church will be stronger. Spiritual nearsightedness says, oh, we can't do this. Spiritual vision says, but I can do this. I can do this, and I can do this. Ask God what you can do. Some of you, because you work a lot, um, you're, you're probably been saying, man, I don't have enough time to spend with God. I don't have enough time to spend with my family. God has now given us a time to spend with him and a time to spend with our family. I have been home more than I have ever had before. I spend time with my wife 
with my, with my daughter, with my dog, and he's driving me crazy. My dog is driving me crazy. I didn't realize he had this much energy. Normally I see him at the end of the day when he's tired. But my dog has so much energy. Anyway, that's beside the point. God wants you to see what you can do now. Don't dwell on what you can't do. Figure out what you can do and do it now for the glory of God. Secondly, um, spiritual vision begins to speak differently. If you're spiritually nearsighted, your speech is going to be negative, it's going to be defeated, it's going to be, woe is me. Spiritual vision will cause you to see that even through this, God can work. Even through this, you can reach out to unsaved friends. You can send them a, a text or, or a WhatsApp, I always say that wrong, and ask them how they're doing and let them know you're praying for them. You can connect with them that way and, 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 and spread the love of God to them. This situation gives you an opportunity to express how concerned you are for them and how much you love them. See what you can do. That's what David did. He saw what God could do through this. Don't just see what we see in the physical. Make sure you see what God would have you to see in the spiritual. So as I was getting ready for this message, this is how the Lord works. Someone sent me a video clip of a pastor I had never heard of speaking on this same passage, and he was speaking about how the church can be stronger after this whole ordeal that, that the world is going through now. It's about a four-minute clip, and we're going to take a little time to watch that right now. One of the most notorious villains in the Bible is a man by the name of Goliath, a nine foot tall giant who had been fighting since the days of his youth. He became a man that had a reputation for war. Everybody that fought him lost. And he came to the children of Israel, God's people one day to challenge them. He says, yo, I wanna fight whoever will come out here and fight me. But because he was so big, the children of Israel were intimidated by him. He never actually threw a punch. He never actually swung his sword. All he had to use was his words because the visual was so intimidating and his words were so powerful, the children of Israel became immobilized and paralyzed by the news of what he was saying. Well, there was a young boy by the name of David who said, I see the same thing y'all see and I hear the same thing you're hearing, but I refuse to allow that to intimidate me because I believe that God is on my side. David began to reflect on the victories that God gave him in times past and he refused to believe that this opposition was greater than anything that he had overcome before. If God could do it for me back then, he'll do it again. And so the Bible declares that David took off running toward this giant to fight him. But the problem was all he had was a little slingshot. The giant sees him coming, starts laughing and says, y'all going to send me a kid. So I'll tell you what, little boy, I'm going to cut your head off and feed it to the beast of the field. But instead of David receiving that evil report or that bad news, he reversed it and said, nah, I'm going to cut your head off and feed it to the beast of the field. And the Bible declares that when David said it, he didn't have the proper provision to do it. I mean, you got a slingshot. You can't chop nobody's head off with that. But here's the thing about God. When you make a prophetic declaration and he's backing you, he will provide for you what you need to fulfill what you said. David took his slingshot, what he had, and started using it. It didn't seem like much. It's a mere weapon that they used to fight off wolves when you were a shepherd. But he used it. He swung the rock and his natural weapon touched with God's super and created the supernatural, which in turn produced a weapon of mass destruction. Hits Goliath in the head. Goliath falls. And then God provides and says, there, there's a sword that you didn't bring with you, but you can use to fulfill what you said. God will always have proper provision for you when you move in faith and obedience. David grabs Goliath's sword, chops Goliath's head off with his own sword. Now, I believe when Goliath woke up that morning, not one time when he grabbed the weapon that was forged or the weapon that was formed to go against God's people, did he think that this is going to be used against me to destroy me? He didn't think that. But you know what? The enemy always believes his weapons are going to be effective against us. But little does he know, we refuse to be intimidated by what we see. Yes, we see how big it is. Yes, we see the stature. Yes, we hear the bad news. We hear the negative report. But we're not going to allow it to immobilize us or paralyze us. We're going to have the spirit of David and move forward with what we have. Yes, we're going to use social distancing because that's the strategy they've offered to us. Yes, we're going to pray in our homes and stream our church services because that's what they've asked us to do. Feels like 
like a slingshot, right? Nah, once we put the super with our natural, we produce a supernatural result and through streaming and through praying in our homes and through even this brief time of separation, the church is going to get stronger. Believers are going to become more confident and the power of God is going to manifest in our homes. When we come back together, we will see young children crying out to God. We will see new strategies and ideas that are going to progress us and push us forward. More creativity than we've ever experienced before in the spirit of excellence and intentionality are going to be great in the body of Christ. So Satan, we want to let you know, when you woke up and you thought that you were going to use this thing against us, nah, the very thing you thought you were going to use to destroy us, God's going to work through us. We're going to turn that thing around and see the greatest revival we've ever seen. I'm telling y'all, this giant is coming down. I hope you enjoyed that. And finally, what I'd like you to do is sometime this week, Take some time to listen to a song by Hezekiah Walker. It's called Better. I had never heard it before. Um, it is filmed all around the world, and it just speaks about how things are going to get better. So please take some time to look, listen, watch that and listen to it, enjoy it, so that we can have spiritual 2020 in 2020.